Talk is by Anton. Take it away, Anton. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really lovely to see you today. Uh, so my name is Anton, and I do product security things at Atlassian. So welcome to my talk, which is called Against Lies, Hacking Lies. This is a talk about using statistics to make good security decisions. So let's start with the survey. Please raise your hand if you love the color purple. Fantastic. It looks like all of us love the color purple. So we all know that a large group of people is just like a small group of people, but scaled up. Therefore, by simple extrapolation, right, right? So by simple extrapolation, I can make the absolutely 100% true conclusion that everyone loves the color purple. I mean, you like purple, I like purple, everyone in this room likes purple, everyone we know likes purple. We can just stop making things in other colors because purple is clearly the superior color. I mean, really, what even other colors are there? Clearly, okay, so this is completely wrong. Um, it's a flagrant abuse of statistics to misrepresent some data. In fact, this kind of foul play is so common that a particular phrase has come to represent it. You may have heard this phrase misquoted as follows. There are lies, hacking lies, which are bad. And then there are statistics, which are good and true and trustworthy. But actually, that wasn't the real quote. The real quote was this. There are three kinds of lies. There are lies, which are bad. There are hacking lies, which are worse. And worst of all, there are statistics. The point being that you can tell a lie with nothing to back you up, but are people going to believe you? No, hopefully the truth will come out. However, if your lying is backed up by a supposed statistical analysis, people will believe you, and it will cause you to do ridiculous things like forcing your users to rotate their passwords every 30 days. <laughs> Let's explore this idea further through a case study of a contemporary team of security defenders, the Crystal Gems. So who are these people? Well, they are a bunch of weirdos dressed in brightly colored clothes who are basically trying to defend the Earth from various kinds of security threats, like monsters and space invasion, you know, the usual. So you know, in their daily job, they're, they're trying to do a very big, big job, and they're basically the blue team of planet Earth. Um, now, because they are defending the entire planet Earth, a very large attack surface, they want to make sure they do a good job. So they start collecting data and collecting, trying to figure out some statistics about what is going on in their day-to-day -day work. So, yeah, statistics. That's going to take a lot of fancy maths, right? Might need a couple of years in university, some night classes, decent magnifying glass. Uh, actually, um, I have some very good news for you, which is that you don't need fancy maths to understand the principles of good statistics, because these are not mathematical rules. They are logical rules. This is about understanding connections between event A and event B, such as flossing causes you to have fewer cavities. Studying information security causes you to get better at information security. And attending PurpleCon causes you to drink bubble tea. <laughs> that's, that's definitely causation. And even if you don't plan on performing analyses on your own security systems in your data, understanding the principles that govern these connections will let you see if other analyses are getting it wrong. Let's see an example of what it means to see connections in a system and why it's so important. So in Beach City, which is where the Crystal Gems live, there is this wonderful haunted lighthouse, and it's got everything, you know, like the dark corners and the creaking floorboards, all that good stuff. So, of course, all the town teenagers rock up to take a look at this supposed haunted lighthouse. The first teenager, Lars, decides to go inside. He's not scared, so he goes inside and mysteriously vanishes in a flash of light and doesn't come out of the house. Hmm, okay. The next teenager, Ronaldo, he loves spooky stuff. He's going to investigate what happened to Lars. So he goes in and mysteriously disappears in a flash of light and doesn't come out of the house. Huh. The third teenager, Buck, thinks it's all bogus. The other two are just messing around. He's going to go in and grab them. So he goes in and mysteriously disappears in a flash of light and doesn't come out of the house. Hmm. By the time the fourth teenager, Jenny, is about to go in, we're all screaming, what are you, some kind of television character? Yes, not recognizing the connection between A and B. Entering the lighthouse causes this monster to attack you, there's a flash of light, and then you don't come out again. Seeing connections like this it keeps us alive on a daily basis, and we do it quickly and we do it automatically. This is the connection machine of the brain, and it is always working to see connections in the world around us. The trouble comes when we start to see connections that aren't really there. So let's get back to the crystal gems defending the planet Earth. As they go about their work, they see incidents, and they record data on the incidents. And they start to notice that, for example, when a tiny centipede attacks their base, they only need to send Steven to deal with it by himself. In fact, he gave it a heartwarming talk about the value of friendship and adopted it as a pet. However, when a terrifying fleet of space dictators attacks their home, they have to send the entire team to deal with it. And they keep seeing a lot of incidents like this. So finally, they collect all the data, they plot it on a graph, and they come to this conclusion. 
The more defenders you send to deal with an incident, the worse that incident will be. <laughs> so clearly, all we have to do to stop these incidents is just stop sending people, right? That's how it works. OK, so <laughs> the Crystal Gem saw these two events happening together in their system and came to the conclusion that there must be a causation between them. But common sense will tell you that, of course, although there is a causation between them, it is in the opposite direction. So this is one way that the connection machine can mess up. However, this one is quite obvious to all of us. Sometimes it is not that obvious. So for, let's say now the Crystal Gems want to know if having a pop positive, optimistic attitude makes you a better defender of planet Earth. Is this true? Does having a positive, you know, thinking kind of attitude make you better at security? I think we would all very much like to believe this, yes? But is it true? So to find out whether this is true, the Crystal Gems start collecting data on their daily operations. And at the start of each attack, they will measure whether the defender had a positive or negative attitude about this oncoming incident, and then whether they were able to successfully or not successfully defend against that incident. So here's the data they collected in their experiment. Garnet was very confident that she could do her job well, and in fact, she very much successfully beat off the attackers. Pearl was also confident she could do it, and she sliced the attackers to bits, no problem. Stephen, though, he's new to the team. He was worried he wouldn't be able to do it successfully. Sure enough, he had to be bailed out by Garnet. As for Amethyst, she thought the whole idea was stupid and wouldn't work, and she failed by falling off a cliff. So this is all the data they collected from their observation. Hallelujah, could we possibly have a more clearly defined trend? 100% of positive thinkers succeeded, 100% of negative thinkers failed. We can now publish on every security blog on the entire internet. Positive thinking is good for security. I really, I really hope you're a little bit suspicious of this. But this time, we can't just say that the causation had to be flipped in the other direction, because unless you're feeling like breaking the laws of physics today, it might be one of those days, I don't know. Um, unless you're feeling like doing that, time always flows in a linear fashion, effects must follow cause. And we know in this case that the attitudes of each defender came before the results of their defending. So that can't be what was wrong with our idea. Uh, however, there is still something wrong with this picture. What is it? It's that there was a third variable lurking in our data which we didn't identify. And here it is. If it appears that this incident is no big deal and can be easily dealt with, we're more likely to think we can handle it and to successfully do so. So this third variable is causing the other two to appear together despite the fact that there is no causation between them. And this third variable is called a confounding variable. The statistics is unfortunately full of confounding variables. For example, Suppose we notice that in companies which have expensive firewalls, they have on average better security. And the more expensive the firewall, the better the security. What's wrong? Well, there could be confounding variables. We don't know. It could be, in fact, that a successful company will have money to burn to spend on expensive firewalls and will have better security for other reasons. In fact, the same confounding effect can be seen for any popular piece of security advice, such as, suppose we notice as mentioned, that companies which have frequent forced user password rotation have on average better security. And the more, they, the more they force it, the better the security. What is the problem here? Well, we thought this was going on, but in fact, it could just as well be this. A conscientious company is more likely to follow popular security advice, whatever it is, even if it doesn't work, and to have better security because they're conscientious. In fact, we know that the opposite effect is true for the forced password rotation. It is actively bad for security. But nonetheless, many such bad policies will still be found to correlate with good security, to appear in companies which have good security, because in these companies, it is being bundled along with a whole lot of security advice which genuinely does work. This brings us to the big headache, the major compound migraine of all security statistics, which is that security studies rarely use the full scientific method. And this is important because statistics is a kind of science. So uh, remind me, what are the five steps of the scientific method? I'll give you a hint. The first one is to observe some data. If you remember some other, let's just shout them out. What's the next step, anyone? Form a, Form a hypothesis, yes. What's next? Yes, you've got to test it, yes. What happens then? Yeah, OK, you get results and you make a conclusion. Cool. So fire, earth, wind, water, and harsh. And with these steps combined, we have the scientific method. Now, if you did this all properly in order, all five steps, you would have this very powerful piece of scientific inquiry called the interventional study, or clinical study, as they call it in medicine. And this is the gold standard of science. However, the problem is that what most of us in security are doing only brings us to step two. <laughs> so we're falling a little bit short of good science. Um, we are only performing an observational study, which means we are looking at our security systems and trying to figure out, oh, how did that happen? How did this work? We are not taking our systems, breaking them into two parts, and performing intervention on one of them. That would be the interventional study. And as long as we are only performing these two steps, an observational study, we cannot definitively identify the causation in our systems. 
One more time, because this is very important. Almost all security studies that you have seen and ever will see in any security journal are observational. And you can't determine causation from observational studies. But Anton, I hear you cry, why don't we just do interventional studies then, since apparently they can determine causation. And there is a perfectly good reason for this, which is that it's very expensive. Common sense reason. Um, however, suppose that you're determined, you're going to do it, you want to know the causation in your security system, you're going to run an interventional study and I can't talk you out of it. Does this solve all your problems? Let's see. No, it doesn't. <laughs> so unfortunately, there are things you have to watch out for in interventional studies, such as non-representative samples. Did I manage to convince you earlier that everyone loves the color purple? Yeah, I hope not. Because we all know that purple con attendees are outliers in how much we like the color purple. And our results can't be transferred to the entire world population. Just the same, when you go to a conference and you read a white paper from a vendor about some fabulous new security tool they have created, Inspect. Look at how their system is different to yours. You may have different OSs, different complementary tools, different platforms. The more their system differs to yours, the more that it was not a representative sample of what you wanted to learn about. And this paper may not actually be very generalizable to your own system. And a very common blind spot for this kind of problem is that an anti-phishing anti campaign that works for your own security team may not generalize to your colleagues in software engineering, UI design, and finance because you are different populations. So look for studies that are either performed on the niche population you want to learn about, or else look for uh, very large studies with a wide, uh, varied demographic that will cover lots of different types of situations. Something else that we should watch out for while performing interventional studies is uncontrolled variables. So suppose that the Crystal Gems have decided to run an interventional study. They have noticed that there are differences between all their weapons. They hypothesize some of the weapons are better, more effective for defense than others. They're going to run an experiment to test that hypothesis. We are going to look at the results together, all of us, and we are going to make a conclusion. So here was the experiment that they ran. Everyone got different weapons. So here are the weapons highlighted there, the gauntlets, the spear, the whip, and the cannon, A, B, C, and D. And then the, here are the results that they got from running this experiment. So just shout out, which was the best weapon? B, right? It's got to be B, right? What if I told you that actually C was the best weapon here? How could this be? Well, it's because when we ran this experiment, we were not really just seeing the effect of the weapon on success. We were really seeing many combined effects, such as we had four different defenders here. They all have different levels of skill and experience. Of course, this is going to affect their rate of success. They're all defending different targets, which are easier or harder to defend. This is going to affect their success. And there are many other differences between these four trials which we did not keep consistent. Finally, on top of this pile is the effect of what we wanted to see, the effect of the weapon. But by this point, the effect of what we wanted to see has been completely buried in a pile of noise from everything else that was going on. To get a meaningful result from this experiment, we would be much better off trying to keep, just have one defender defending all the targets. And we'll have her just defend one target. And don't, don't keep changing all the other things. Keep everything consistent apart from the one thing that we want to inspect, which is the weapon. Now we have ended up with an experiment which has isolated the effect we wanted to see. And we have controlled the other variables, and we have a meaningful result. The last thing I'd like to give you is a test that you can use on any conclusions that you make uh, while running a security uh, study yourself or reading the results of another security study that you want to apply. And it's this. If you can explain a study's conclusion and its reverse equally well, then you have no knowledge. For example, suppose that Garnet has gone out for a couple of weeks. She's tried lots of different size gauntlets. She comes back home to Stephen and says, you know, Stephen, I've got my data graphed on the paper here, and I can see that the bigger and heavier the gauntlets were, the more effective they were. And Stephen laughs, oh, of course, you know, a bigger, heavier gauntlet has more momentum when it punches a, you know, a bug or a monster and defends a base. Um, and then Garnet pauses and looks at the paper and says, oh, sorry, I actually got the graph upside down. Uh, the smaller and lighter the gauntlets were, the more effective they were. And Stephen pauses and then rallies, oh, yes, a smaller, lighter gauntlet is easier to swing, so of course it's more effective. Uh, my question for you is, if Stephen can explain both of these results equally well, how well does he really understand the connection between the gauntlet size and the success? Yeah, not very, right? He's rationalizing. So if you find that by this test you are also rationalizing and you can explain any result, um, then go back and look at the data because it means that you don't really understand the system you are looking at well enough. Because if you do understand it, you will understand that some results really are, some conclusions really are more likely to occur than others. Key takeaways for this talk. 
be suspicious of observational studies. Links to, related to, correlated with, does not mean caused by. In an observational study, there could be confounders and you have no way to tell. Security studies that you read, such as a white paper at a conference, may not transfer to your own situation. The more that their study population, their study system, differed from your system in terms of the OS, complementary tooling, platform, etc. Um, maybe it's, perhaps it's a large company, you have a small company. The more it differs to your own situation, the less applicable it is and the less it transfers. It is scientifically proven that everyone loves the color purple. <laughs> and in an interventional study, try to keep everything consistent and the same apart from the one thing you are trying to study the effect of such as the weapon in our previous example. Uh, there were a lot of other things that unfortunately did not fit into this talk, so please do take a look at The Great Archai for more groovy statistical knowledge, um, or talk to me on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anton. I will see you all in one minute for a talk by Moss.